Good morning. <laughs> what a privilege to follow Vanessa's talk and to be here with everyone. Thank you, Simone Lee. Thank you, Rashida Bumri. Thank you to the entire Loophole of Retreat team for working your magic so that we could all be here together. I'm going to start my presentation with a short excerpt from Mayal, written by Erna Broadbow. Nick, I think we can play for a minute and then pause. Long conversations between herself took place in her head, mostly accusations. He took everything I had away, made what he wanted of it, and gave me back nothing. It was you who let him take everything. You gave him everything. But I didn't even know when I was giving it that it was mine and my everything. How could you not have known? Mule, with blinders on. You wouldn't listen, you wouldn't see. Can we pause there? That's a monologue where Ella has suffered a breakdown, a splitting of herself. Mile is the same novel that the quote that was on the screen is from. On one level, the novel tells the story of a community dealing with two cases of spirit thievery, being, being experienced by two young women in their rural community in a small town in Jamaica. One theft being by an unsuspected black male elder who in spirit has crept into the bed of young Anita in a desperate attempt to regain his virility. The other instance is by a white American husband of Ella, who she's taken from Jamaica to meet in the US, away from her black farm worker mother, where she now passes for white and serves as a muse for her white American husband's minstrel shows. On another, on another level, Mayal tells the story of the subversive, largely unseen, largely unspoken, but retained ancestral ways that a marginal community led by Miss Gatha, who Broadbow describes as a systemic force, a coconut tree in a private hurricane. This community reorganizes for itself the relationships between race, gender, and class that have been imposed on it from slavery. I think we can start playing again. The, this unspoken retention itself is a type of marinage. I've highlighted the quote, though, on the screen that you saw before because it points to a birthing moment in Mayal that occurred almost entirely in an outwardly unspoken spiritual domain. Whereas the passage I read, Ella's monologue, speaks to the economy of life and how imperial, colonial, extractive social constructs organize that economy and even become internalized, which is the point of departure for my, for my work as an artist. While Wilson Harris, who you saw, who, whose review you saw a brief image of, himself is a writer of black and indigenous reorganization through magical realism in post-independence Guyana, states in a review he wrote of Erna Bradbaugh's work, is it not possible to see Ella as the victim of an enlightenment that has long concentrated in the humanities on patterns of behaviorism as a logical field in itself? For me though, the passage that I read to you resonates in a first-hand way, lived reality. I responded viscerally as if it was a memory of a conversation I once had had with myself. A voyage of the psyche, as Harris puts it. That same economy of life that precipitates Ella's breakdown is what black geographer Daniel Purifoy gets at directly in her essay, Birthing from the Bottom. Purifoy states, the bottom is the entanglement of black peoples with the extraction and commodification of natures for the development of wealth and power, for the sustaining of white dominated political space. Per Charles Mills, the Jamaican American political philosopher, the black peoples and spaces constituting the bottom are construed as the morally debased and waste producing parts of the body politic. In other words, as a wilderness to be acted upon by civilized white space. Black people under this white imaginary are thus part of an undifferentiated, extractable resource. Such is the character of the continuing plantation economy per Jamaican economist George Beckford. The replication of colonialism and its ecology onto contemporary landscapes through new configurations of resource extraction and wealth production. Through isolating consolidated power and wealth so far from the sites of production and reality that its holders believe they can survive without the bottom 
indeed without a functioning planet. Purifoy lays it out. The conditions generated by these configurations indicate with some certainty that this system cannot continue. When it crumbles, what will emerge? The constitutive subordination and thingification of black peoples and nature requires not only a re-articulation of black liberation, but also a major change in the characterization and valuation of natures. The bottom Daniel Purifoy tells us in black feminist tradition is the space where possibility exists for true revolutionary loving liberation. My work as an artist concerns itself with this recharacterization and reevaluation re of nature's purifoy rights of in an evolving material experimentation to develop a syntax that centers and shifts the ways black, that, that black female embodiment is paralleled with land. Shifting this value through aesthetics and praxis driven by the question, what are the ways of, for this revaluation to feed back in a life-giving way to the local reality of the fertile, fecund wilderness situated at the bottom, ecologically, socioeconomically, and spiritually. For me, aesthetics, can we pause here, Nick? Aesthetics is a means of thinking through these ideas, but also a point of departure to move beyond the limitations of art and symbolism. Thinking about feeding this fertile wilderness, I started working on an institute sculpture project in Maroon Town, St. James called Training Stations last year in Jamaica, called Training Stations. And I started this last year through the Soros Arts Fellowship and later as part of the UPenn Just Futures Initiative. We can resume. On historical familial land that my great grandparents bought at, the t at about the time that Africans could legally do so in Jamaica. The space carries that family history, but also a history tied to emancipation from slavery. The environs of Maroon Town is where many Africans escaped to and hid from, from West Coast plantations. It's where battles of the Maroon Wars between runaways, Africans, and colonial British forces were fought and won by Africans. And it's where the infamous Maroon Peace Treaty was signed, granting autonomy of the cockpit country from the British Constitution in 1738. And today, the cockpit country is a target for mining. I want to pause right here. Training stations, which you saw uh, an image of just now, um, and you saw some uh, weaving activities happening in, involves efforts to archive, reforest, and make space for forms of ancestral knowledge through sculpture and craft. It involves an effort to relate to natures in an equitable and ecologically generative way. Thinking about fertility, labor, and the erotic potential, and appending its relationship to mining, Began, began as, an, as aesthetic gestures in my past work. We can replay again. The loaded meanings and values of the particular phenotypes I refer to in the work, such as Afro kinky hair, living plants, are brought to the fore when confronted with, with reflections of the viewer in the system of aesthetic reorganization. And through abstraction, there's a denial of access to the body of the subject in the work even as the erotic potential is at play. I'm going to get back to what I'm working on currently in the studio, but um, first I wanted to change gears. Um, these are some images of, of past work. I'm going to change gears to thinking broadly about working in ways that create tangible value shifts that feed back into the local socioeconomic reality and the kinds of environments we create for ourselves. Can we pause? In a life-giving way through art practices. A few years after completing grad school, I moved back home to Kingston where I started new local space. The structure of NLS came to be largely in response to the realities of being an artist in Jamaica. There being no public funding you could apply to, no art residency programs, or no type of incubatory support system that was present. Through working with NLS, there are a number of important art practices that we've been lucky enough to encounter and to help support. And with each residency or fellowship, the project, with each residency or fellowship project, the issue of equity always comes up in some way. The diversity of art practices and experiences means that we collectively and continually have to roll that issue around, seeing it from a number of positionalities, 
looking at the challenges and the way forward. Responsibility for and accountability to each other has helped to facilitate this and build it into a model of residences and fellowships that we continue to try to adapt to help um, provide that incubatory support after art school for local artists. So I want to start first with Sasha K. Hines. Um, we can play. Sasha K. Hines's work. Sasha K. Hines works through performance. She's a recent graduate of the Edna Manley College of the Visual and Performing Arts. And she works through performance, video, and photography, moving from interrogating her own experience experiences with teen pregnancy to exploring broader themes of failure and pain in relationships, attending quests for joy and freedom. In her own words, she draws from the insecurity of intimate narratives, complicating notions of self-identity and intersectional feminism, feminism, embracing mystery, solitude, and what she refers to as sass, to propose layered and complicated notions of beauty. Importantly, her work also shines a light on the lack of legislative support for child protection, reproductive rights, and victims of abuse in Jamaica. Sasha K just recently completed a residency at NLS um, during the pandemic, during the, I guess, the lockdowns is what I should say, because we, I guess, technically we still are in a pandemic. And, um, and she's currently in an exhibition uh, that we had that just opened last week at NLS called Citing Black Girlhood. Right now, um, we have ongoing workshops with Sasha Kay and a cohort of young women who've just graduated from Edna Manley College to work with them to apply, to work with them so that they can prepare their applications for graduate school. And then we have Joni Gordon, who also recently um, completed a residency at NLS, who deconstructs her experience as an immigrant worker in the US State Department's work and travel program which recruits tertiary students from low and middle income countries to work for minimum wage in the US. The program describes itself as a means for cultural exchange and financial empowerment to afford education in the student's home countries. But through her work, Joni provides a counter narrative of debt and discrimination that underpins these programs, fleshing out the link between geopolitical power, racial discrimination, and the realities of individuals who live in the global south as well as the personal trauma. So in terms of support structures, specific, specifically for individual residency, NLS provides a $300,000 JMD um, work stipend, 24 hour access to the studio space for 10 to 12 weeks, um, professional studio visits, and a solo exhibition. Can we pause right here? The Curatorial and Art Writing Fellowship follows a similar model with a work stipend and a committee of mentors who offers guidance in terms of methods, inquiry, and practical concerns with exhibition planning. And then we have a podcast program that works in tandem with the residences and fellowships. Okay, I wanted to pause here um, to talk a bit about one other practice, uh, well, two in one, really. Um, I hope to talk about two practices at the same time. Um, recently, I mentioned that we had an exhibition citing black girlhood, um, presented in partner with UPenn and the University of Johannesburg at NLS. And we invited four women artists in Jamaica whose practices are invested in black female subjecthood to create a portrait of a young woman in her life, collaborating with her in its making. And Onika Russell created a portrait of her past student, Michaela Garrick, also inviting Garrick to contribute her own autobiographical work to the exhibition. And that's a picture of Michaela on the right. In Onika's Russell's statement about Michaela, she says, I first met Michaela when I was offering a workshop titled Life After Art School. One of the points of the workshop, as I've learned through my own practice, is to ensure that self-care and rest are an integral part of the process. I noticed that Michaela was nodding about this during the lecture. I met her again at the opening of her final year show, and her installation was a space made from woven sugar cane. We can play. 
woven sugar cane at the center where beds laid out under the open sky. Michaela shared her struggles to reconcile her childhood, living on Money Musk Plantation with her mother, a worker on the plantation, the tensions and traumas of family heritage tied to the plantation, paternal absenteeism, physical and mental awareness, and a need for healing. Michaela's work, however, was intricately crafted for other women to find refuge. Through her story and her work, she echoes in a specific but very central way how black girls often carry an exhaustion through life from all that we fight through, often for others. I make this work to celebrate the many young women I have taught who have had to overcome great hurdles to pursue a creative career. Often this creative practice is its own path to being comfortable, finding rest and peace with oneself and one's experience. Okay, um, I ended that on um, the current work in the studio, um, which I just wanted to briefly talk about. A lot of the planting being done involves learning about how the land has changed and what Vanessa says really resonates with me on that and the new challenges this presents. Um, so far we've planted over 300 trees, um, including cashew, blue, maho, mahogany, cedar, and avocado. And I'll end by coming back to this image that I, I showed in the beginning from that recent body of work of paintings with cook shop, charcoal, and essential but undervalued and loosely protected natural resource in Jamaica. Again, the question of physically shifting how we see the value of resources. How does our, va how, how does our value for charcoal transform with a change in the perspective of seeing it as an essential fuel for survival in local marginal economies to seeing it as a luxury consumer byproduct whose value is tied to parameters removed from the local realities of black people living in the global south? What is the potential of that shift to feed that fecund wilderness? Thank you.